What's going on, everybody? This is uh, Dr. Kenyon Hackworth from Healthy You, Wealthy You, where my focus is on improving health and building generational wealth. March is National Nutrition Month. In, in the art of National Nutrition Month, I'm here with two registered dietitians. We have Renice Weaver and Ms. Fabiola Gaines. Pleasure, I'm, I'm happy to be here with you guys today. Thank you for coming. We are excited about the interview today. Yes. We're happy to have you here in Florida. Yes, sunny <laughs> Orlando, Florida. So we wanna talk about what you guys do and how you benefit and help the community, especially the African-American community where there's a lot of uh, information that we need. First of all, what you do, your, your business is Ebony Nutritional Consultants, correct? Yes, it is. Ebony is a acronym. Uh, which stands for Health Empowerment Through Behavioral and Nutritional uh, Initiatives. Mm -hmm. And it was founded by, proudly founded, by three African-American dietitians. Okay. And myself, Fabiola Gaines, and Eloretha Carson. Ah. And we have had a wonderful time trying to make our community healthy. And we're in the heart and in Central Florida of the highest incidence of diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and strokes, and obesity. So we're, we're happy to be here. So with all those diseases that you just named, what is the role of a dietitian in helping people to overcome those, or, or deal with those, or improve their health regarding those particular diseases? Well, I wanna first of all say we're not the food police, mm -hmm. but we are here to educate, uh, train, motivate, and encourage healthy behaviors, uh, whether it's diabetes or heart disease or obesity, we're here to be an access and resource to an underserved population that needs help from a registered dietitian. Okay. And I, and I think one of the things that people often confuse is they believe that a dietitian is a food police. <laughs> and if you go to a dietitian, your diet is going to be restricted and you can't eat this and you can't eat that. Is that true or what, how do you go about recommending people to make changes with diet? Well, that is not true, but that's a, a misnomer we're trying to, to eradicate as far as dietitians are concerned, especially in the African-American community. Because as soon as they hear dietitian, as you said, oh, I won't be able to eat no fried chicken, no macaroni and cheese, no this, no that. But we are trying to educate them on how to have those foods that are traditional to our heritage, but not have a whole plate. When I uh, give our portion control plate out to our classes, I said, if you can get a four piece Popeye's chicken in this, in this little uh, section, you can have it. But you can't go high. <laughs> You can take the bones out, but you have to stay within this ridge. So I did take the uh, fried chicken, but I restricted the portion size as well. Okay, so portion control is, is at the height of things, even more so than per se the actual foods, because people often associate soul food with unhealthy eating. And I know I grew up in Alabama, I like soul food. I know a lot of, all my family does. So you can still eat soul food, it's just about oh. portion control and how you cook it and prepare absolutely, it? Absolutely, absolutely. Soul food just need a face mm -hmm. uh, But we are, as African-American dietitians, we are not here to take cultural foods away from any, any person's background. Our goal is to show you how to eat it healthy. Uh, I focus on three Ps, how to purchase it correctly, how to prepare it correctly, and then how to plate it correctly. Mm -hmm. If you focus on those three things, you can eat soul food, mm -hmm. but we gotta really just kind of give it a facelift and reduce the fat, salt, and sugar in it. That's, it's gotten greasy over the years, it's gotten sweeter over the years, and saltier. But if we can really go back to the way our forefathers ate, they, they didn't do that bad. When you look at the Western diet of, of Africa and what they ate, they ate pretty good. And, but we, gotten our Western culture here in the United States, and we greased it up real bad. <laughs> a, good, a good example of that is when, when I talk to my diabetics, um, they automatically think they can't have nothing with sugar. You know, sugar is completely out of their diet, but that's not true. So when it comes to dessert, I tell them to hold up one finger. 
that's the width of your pound cake. Two fingers is the width of your sweet potato pie. Oh, your finger. If you have fat fingers, you have it in the bank. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm doing is restricting the portion size of those foods. But I didn't say they couldn't have it. I said that you can only have the width of one finger for cake and the width of two fingers for pie. Okay. And people can live with that. So the, the hand, I often heard about the, the size of your hand has something to do with, with food control or food portion too. Yeah. Do you guys yeah. use that or is this oh, a, a plate that you guys use too? Yeah, yeah. Speaking of that, we developed uh, back in 2010 the Soul Food Plate. And it is a, a, a food information pamphlet that helps people understand how to put their food on their plate. Mm -hmm. This actually put us on the map because we created the Food Guide Pyramid years ago and then we modified it when USDA switched to the My Plate method, which is mm -hmm. teaching people how to put food on the plate. That's what we don't understand. They, they understand servings, they read labels, but when it comes down to let's eat, they eat with their eyes and they yes. don't focus on portions. Now, with that pamphlet, where can people who are not in Orlando find that information? Is there a website that yeah, they can go to? Yeah, you can to? go to our website and get information on the soul food plate. But more importantly, this soul food plate is not only for us, it's also for us to educate our white counterparts mm -hmm. how to teach to our black audiences. Because we, ha we find that our, our Hispanic sisters, our white sisters, who are registered dietitians, need to be culturally competent. Mm -hmm. So if you're gonna teach a person of color, you need to come with some street cream. You need to have some um, information that makes sense to that person. So they can identify, because they are already afraid that you're gonna make them eat Asparagus. Uh, asparagus. <laughs> a keto sprouts. Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts. <laughs> uh, arugula that they can't find at the grocery store. They really worry about that. Mm -hmm. And then they say, okay, baby, bye. And you'll never see them again. Now, how many black dietitians are there? Because you talked about people talking about talking to people of color about diet, but for the most part, it seems like most of the dietitians I've met where I am in Cincinnati. Or, or Caucasian. So okay. how many black dietitians are there in the well, United States? Well, there's 70,000 dietitians in this country. 2% mm -hmm. of them look like me. 2%? That's it. That's it? So the instance of an uh, individual, of African-American individual seeing a black dietitian is rare. So for us to be in this community, and the two black dietitians, and we have a Hispanic dietitian that's in our office also. This is truly an advantage to this community because they can walk through our door and get help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you hit the jackpot to just see two of us in the same room. Mm -hmm. uh, many times you won't find us, uh, but we, we do have a recruitment problem or a inclusion problem on, across the country. and. That, that's why I'm wearing my shirt today. Black dietitians do matter. Mm -hmm. It's important for us to recruit the next generation. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you want your children to interface with the African American dietitian, we need them to go to college. Tuskegee, Howard, FAMU, uh, Spelman, and major in foods and nutrition. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful career path, but we are not seeing the growth pattern of that profession. If you're going to see the next generation teach people how to monitor their behaviors through diet, they really need to see someone that looks like them because the information is embraced better. And if they are going to be defiant and say, I, don't, I can't do that, she at least got a different alternative that makes sense to them. Mm -hmm. and, and when we counsel our African Americans, we talk to them like we're talking to our moms. Mm -hmm. They already know we're educated, so we don't need to use four or five syllable words. Right. We need them to understand that this is what you do to reduce your blood glucose. This is what you do to reduce the sodium in your diet. And you will see the results of, of your hemoglobin A1C coming down and your blood pressure numbers 
being close to normal as possible. Tell them about the lady you just saw a few weeks ago. Oh yeah, uh, we have a class that we we offer here. It's called Oasis. It's an eight week wellness class. And uh, this individual came to our class. We do labs on our uh, participants because we want to find undiagnosed diabetics and pre-diabetics. So she came to me as a diabetic. Her hemoglobin A1C was 10. Scale only go to 12. So that told me right up front that she wasn't doing what she needed to do to monitor her blood glucose. Because the hemoglobin A1C tells us what your blood sugars have done the last three months. So she took the class and um, she came in last week. She had went to the doctor and her A1C was down to seven. You see? Yeah. And yeah. she Black came, doctors is matter though. Black doctors is matter. Kind of, uh, let me know <laughs> that how happy she was because she followed what we discussed in class. And, and I see them individually also because in class I'm talking in general. But when I get them back in their office, I try not to beat them up too much, mm -hmm. but I do beat them up. <laughs> sometimes you have to give tough love. Tough love is the is the best thing you have yeah. to do sometimes. Mm -hmm. So the eight week class you talked about, what does that entail? Is it an educational component? I know you say you did let you do labs. Mm -hmm. So how does that eight week class work, and how you go about doing that? Well, the eight week class uh, we do labs because we want to find out, you know, as I said, pre diabetics or. We want to know the A1C of our diabetics. We do cholesterol screenings. And after we get all of that uh, data, we teach them how to read their labs. Mm -hmm. Because we tell them if they go to the doctor and they stick a needle in their arm, they need to have a copy of their lab work. Mm -hmm. And they need to understand somewhat what the lab work is saying. So after that, we start talking about uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, weight loss, just general nutrition. Because they need to understand, why is my blood pressure not going up? Are you taking your medicines right? Mm -hmm. Are you taking your medication as the doctor prescribed? Or, as, or are you taking it as you feel like you need to take it? I had one individual tell me she took a medication holiday. I'm like, what, <laughs> is, what is that? <laughs> She was tired of taking her medicine and she took a holiday. I said, do you want to have a stroke? I know, you don't want a medication holiday to, to end up being a permanent holiday. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> but these are the, this is how our community thinks sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I said, there's no such thing as that. So we talk about their medications and how they're taking them mm -hmm. and what they need to do to improve their overall health. And it, and uh, Ronisa and I see the results of the class. It's, it's just wonderful feeling to know that you have helped someone make a change. And I think what you guys do is so important because uh, most of the time when people go to the doctor, they don't get that educational component. No. They just go and say, this is what's going on with you. Here's your prescription. Go and take it. I see you in three months or right. six months mm -hmm. or however long. Right. But what you guys do from an educational standpoint when people walk out and they have the knowledge of, they know what they're trying to achieve, they might find themselves being more compliant as right. opposed to just going and say, I'm taking this medication. So how long have you guys been in practice? Uh, over 25 years. Uh, it's been a wonderful journey um, to be a registered dietitian, but it's been a better journey when you work with your best friend and mm -hmm. partner because we, we had the same goal and mission mm -hmm. uh, 25 years ago, and we have been able to grow a nutrition practice and be the first in everything that we do with the development of the test kitchens here in this office, first of its kind in Orlando, and actually in the state of Florida, we have a mobile farmer's market that's on a city bus mm -hmm. that goes out to food deserts, uh, dropping produce to increase access to those who don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. That's and awesome. so we actually really think out of the box uh, concepts that can uh, impact many communities of color. Uh, because when people get sick, they go to the hospital. But when you look at community dietitians, there's no room, uh, there's plenty of room for you to come in and have access to the dietitian, so there's no excuse. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. We don't give you the excuse that I can't get there. The bus is right in front of our building, uh, walkable communities, and you can get to us relatively easy. And we're always here, always. Mm -hmm. Now you just said a term that I'm not really uh, familiar with is food desert. Okay. What exactly is a food desert? A food desert is a community where you you work, live, or play, but it, you don't have access to a full service grocery store. Mm -hmm. And if you have to go more than two miles to get to one, you live in a food desert. This office is in the middle of a food desert. And food deserts are basically when a full service store, Publix, Walmart, Target, uh, Fresh Market, if those stores don't come into your community, it could be because it, the, the population mm -hmm. is not dense enough to support the cost of running a full service store. So you end up with the 7-Elevens and the mom and pop stores and they don't sell produce. Yeah. They sell beer, wine, and junk. And so now your zip code is now defining your health outcomes. And that's a problem. Yeah. That's a real problem. And we, and we see it every day as we uh, progress through this process. And one of the things that we have seen an impact since this office has been here, we've seen a decrease in heart disease and diabetes in this 32805 zip code. So me and Ronique take credit for that. Yes, we will. <laughs> yeah, you should. Yes, you we should. Will. You know, because you know, because we're here and we're educating our community and we give them programs that are addressing their issues, not our issues. You know, as a health professional, we're addressing their issues and it makes a difference. What and and me being a male, what is the, the makeup mm -hmm. as you see as like male versus female who actually comes to get the information? and who, who follows the, the protocols that you give out. How many men compared to women do you oh, guys have? Oh, goodness gracious. That doesn't sound good for us <laughs> men. Y'all come in kicking and screaming. <laughs> but Fab, Fab, I'll let Fab talk about that. She teaches a class just for men only. Mm -hmm. And it's happening tonight. Okay. Uh, the men only class has been, uh, uh, I would say a crown in my, a jewel in my crown. <laughs> Uh, because we're trying, when you look at the death rates of African American men, the life span of African American men, we have got to make a change in that because we need, mm -hmm. need our men to grow old with us. And what we're finding is that they're not going in for checkups. If they're having problems, they're saying, oh, it'll go away. They ignore it. And uh, that's a problem. And the men that I've seen in my classes have all had issues. And what I try to do is bring in health professionals that are male so they can talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. Because, you know, men, y'all are strange animals. <laughs> and it's, it's really important that we have them have access to male doctors. Mm -hmm. And when I see that, um, it really makes a difference because they're able to, uh, Dr. Weaver comes in as one of our physicians and he gets, grabs his chair, he sit down, and I mean, no men be firing questions at him. And I'll sit in the back because I don't want to uh, let them think I'm being nosy as a female does. Because <laughs> <laughs> I talk want about them to, the stuff. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. because I want them to be comfortable to be able to have a physician to take their time out their day to come here and sit with them and answer their questions. We have a what you get five, five minutes of FaceTime with a doc in, yeah. in the office. That's about that, it. That's that's not enough time, especially for a man that's got a lot of concerns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So and so uh, we are really excited about our men's class here, and um, and one thing I do with the men class we cook a little bit more because some of the men are single, are widowers. And then I have young men who are not married. They need to be able to prepare meals for themselves. And uh, it's important for them to have some type of cooking skills to be, to be able to support themselves and not eat out seven days a week. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to get them back in the kitchen. We, we cook with them and um, one, one class, uh, the dad was here and this, it was a uh, father and son uh, duro, and the son was just taking pictures, taking pictures. 
I said, why are you taking so many pictures? I've never seen my dad pick up a spoon. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I'm 40 years old and he's never. <laughs> so he was just so excited that his dad was actually cooking, you know, so it's a lot of fun. So we're hoping that men will sign up for the class and come and join us. Do you find it difficult for men to open up about their health issues with, oh, yeah. with you guys? I know you say when, when, when Dr. Weaver is here, they tend to open up and fire questions, but when it comes to talking to you guys, they might be more reserved. Oh yeah, yeah. They, they, they are. They feel invincible. They still want to be Superman. Mm -hmm. They are considered to be providers, and even as they age, they still want to be in control. Mm -hmm. But once their health fails, they've lost control. Mm -hmm. They're trying to figure out how to get it back. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's one of the things that what I do in, in Cincinnati with uh, my fraternity, Omega Sapphire, best fraternity in the world, is that I'm the, <laughs> so, right. so one of the things that we always uh, promote there is for every member of our chapter, I, I said to do the bare minimum and, and get a physical every single year. That's the least you can do for your family, for your, your loved ones, for your children is, is get a physical. And then once you begin to learn different things from a nutrition standpoint and exercise, you start incorporating those into your life and then that makes you healthier and then that, you can have longevity mm -hmm. and things of that particular nature. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that I always want to promote. So I appreciate you guys for really trying to educate the, and the, the, the black men, the black women, and everybody. How do you guys- If we don't do it, who will? Exactly, yeah. exactly. And how do you attract the, the clients that you're trying to- You to know, get? word of mouth is still strong. Mm -hmm. uh, when you are doing the right thing for the right reason, in the right way, word of mouth is strong mm -hmm. because they'll notice that their next door neighbor lost a lot of weight and they say, girl, how did you do that? And they'll say, well, I went over there to that nutrition practice right there by the football stadium and they are easy to work with. They meet you where they are. They understand what your troubles are and they are just warm and receiving. Mm -hmm. And that's what dietitians need to do. And that's what we try to even teach the next generation of dietetic interns that come through our office, how to be a clone of what we do. Okay. Yeah. And you talked about the diabetes. There are a lot of people who have diabetes. Are there certain foods that people should avoid or certain things they should add more of to help control the blood sugar? You talked about the client that had the A1C uh, number that started out at 10 and she brought it down to seven. Was there a certain, is there still a certain number that's, that you're trying to get to, or is that is that good? Yeah, there's a certain number you're try, trying to get to. You try to have your A1C seven or below. Okay. And um, one of the things that I emphasize uh, is carbohydrates, because mm -hmm. we don't understand how carbohydrates impact our blood sugars and how uh, carbs turn into glucose. And in the class, we discuss that. And you, you can see a light bulb go off when, when you start discussing the carb and blood glucose relationship mm -hmm. and how it impacts your diabetes. Another thing we try to, to do is to make sure they're increasing their, their vegetable consumption mm -hmm. because we tend not to uh, eat a lot of vegetables. You know, greens, collard greens, mustard greens, cabbage is a staple. But we need to eat carrots, we need to eat uh, squash, butternut squash, uh, zucchini squash. We need to incorporate a lot of different vegetables. And when we have our cooking class, that is exactly what we do. We expose them to vegetables that they have not had before. And they see it in the uh, program section, but they say, well, how do you, how you make that? And they so, walk right past. <laughs> so in our class, we are able to uh, expose them to those particular vegetables. So next time they go to the grocery store, they say, oh, I have a recipe for this. And um, prepare for their families. Another thing we tell our participants, when you start reducing the fat, salt, and sugar in your meal prep, don't tell your family. Because as soon as you start broadcasting, what they're going to do, get in the car to go to Popeye's Chicken. Because they're going to automatically think it's tasting bad. So we pride ourselves on low fat, low salt cooking that tastes good. I tell uh, most people, I said, we black dietitians. We want our food to taste good. <laughs> we don't want it to taste like you went outside and picked up some grass and chewed on it. 
So Ronice and I have been fortunate enough to co-author how many books? Six good books for the American Diabetes Association. So yeah. we uh, pride ourselves on how our food tastes using herbs and spices that we were not exposed to growing up. I was telling my class one day, you know, when my mother made spaghetti, she put salt and pepper in it. I didn't know what oregano was when I was growing up. <laughs> you know, so we cook like our moms, you know, so uh, we expose them to a lot of herbs and spices that flavor your food without adding a lot of sodium. The new soul food cookbook. This is awesome. It's filled with recipes. Oh, this is great. Where, where can people get the, your books? Well, you got to hurry up and get it. Uh, because it is about to go out of print. I hear that it's already sold out, uh, but you can find uh, the remaining probably on Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going through a transition with the American Diabetes Association. Mm -hmm. uh, COVID really impacted their book sales tremendously. Mm -hmm. Not only our book, all of their books. Uh, so they're going to a more of a digital format. Uh, so they're releasing the book back to us. So I'm hoping of next year this time, we may have reprinted this book in a different format uh, for us to keep it in the community. I will say proudly over the last 20 years, we've helped raise quite a bit of money for the American Diabetes Association uh, with this book. Their logo is on it, it's endorsed mm -hmm. by them, and it follows all of the diabetes guidelines. Uh, we have been blessed to create these books for them, uh, but we're not going to have another opportunity to just recreate, recreate it and make it our own. Okay, that is fantastic. So now with the reduction in or improvement of health, do you guys see differences with heart disease? How does the, the zip code that a person live in affect their health? I know you talked about food deserts. Yeah. Is, that, is, that, is that the primary thing, food desert and food insecurities as well? Food insecurity, food deserts and food swamps. Mm -hmm. The swamps are the fast food joints. The food deserts are lack of uh, the ability to get to a grocery store and food insecurity is all access. Those all fall under this category called social determinants of health. Mm -hmm. So your zip code sometimes can define your health outcomes, but it makes no sense. So what we're trying to do is improve and improve the access. Mm -hmm. uh, there are people who live in, what's a, a affluent neighborhood in your community? Name one. Indian Hills. Indian Hills. They got a Whole Foods. They got uh, Walmart. And they got Sam's Club, Costco's, and Fresh Market. Mm -hmm. But then when you go to your underserved populations, you see Popeyes, Kentucky Fried Chicken, Texas Fried Chicken, uh, Chipotle, maybe Chipotle. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. Um, but you see a lot of fast food joints. And if those are the places they eat, mm -hmm. they eat, they have a chance to eat fast food seven days a week. Mm -hmm. What's that doing to their body? So they, they, they have the places where the food is easily accessible, but is less on the, on the lower end when Correct. it comes to nutrition. Right. Which you is tend to find cheaper food in lower income neighborhoods, mm -hmm. unfortunately, but it's killing us. Yes. And those social determinants of health are showing showing very well and very well documented in research and in the science. And we need to flip that script. So mm -hmm. for example, when you look at a place uh, that does these pre-packaged meals in these affluent neighborhoods, mm -hmm. how come we don't see them in an underserved neighborhood? Yeah. They, they need it more than a affluent neighborhood. That's true. So how can we replicate that model where it's not quite as expensive um, and still provide that health service and benefit to a community that's lacking. Because if we don't pay and invest in health mm -hmm. in these underserved neighborhoods now, guess what? You pay for it in the emergency room and subsidizing it with your property taxes and so forth. Yes. Because as you look at, especially our senior citizen population that has, you know, a husband or wife has expired and they're having prepare meals for themselves mm -hmm. and if they don't feel like cooking you know they just go dry the Popeyes or Kentucky Fried and, and get a meal whereas if the pre-plated meals are available for them and we 
we specifically target our diabetics, our uh, individuals with high blood pressure. This is a good meal if you are diabetic. This is a good meal if you have high blood pressure. And if you want to lose weight, this is the, the, the meal for you. And make it a nominal fee, cheaper than what they would, would pay for fast food. Because That's called social enterprise. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Because when you go to McDonald's now, yeah. And we're not, we're not going to say if you have any children. Just How much do you spend? A uh, uh, um, filet fish meal, almost eight dollars. So for one person. Yeah. So mm -hmm. think about if we can give you a uh, fish, vegetable, and a carbohydrate for six. That, that's a deal. That, you know, that's, that's something interesting because most people believe that it costs a whole lot more money to eat healthy. <laughs> that's why people don't do it. They say it's cheaper to just go get fast food no. and it's, it's so much more expensive no. to eat healthier. So no. you can be able to I eat healthier without having to spend a lot, without breaking the bank. Mm -hmm. So that's what you're saying. That's why we're here. We mm -hmm. teach people how to get their bang for their buck, how to shop healthy, but also how to make it fit in their budget. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we even had one particular lady, her and her kids, and she said, I have to feed my kids ramen noodles. Mm -hmm. I said, well, you don't have to get high blood pressure from this. We showed her how to make ramen noodles in her own way with whole grain ramen noodles from the Asian store, and we added a boatload of vegetables. And she said, oh my God, I got a lot of food for the rest of the week. But we added the vegetables mm -hmm. and we seasoned it with a low sodium broth, chicken or shrimp broth. Got rid of the packet now. Mm -hmm. Cause that's the thing that's gonna kill you. Yes. <laughs> it's that ramen noodle packet, that seasoning pack. And we showed her how to stretch that budget and she still got what she wanted. It was a win-win. That's awesome. How, how important is family support? Cause you talked about family, and when someone tries to make a change in what they're doing, and then there, may, there might be somebody else in the household who's now with it. So how important is that family support in order to, to help people get over that hump? It's, it's real important because mm -hmm. it can mm -hmm. be very discouraging for the individual yeah. who wants to change their lifestyle. And we, that's, that's why we like to bring in husband and wives, significant others. Cause somebody will so, tell. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so they can understand why this person is changing their lifestyle because they want to live longer. Mm -hmm. They have all these chronic diseases that are impacting their lifestyle and they need to be helped. You need to, uh, we tell uh, women, you don't need to make a meal for you and a meal for your, your husband. Everybody eat the same food. And if you prepare it where it's tasty and it's healthy, they'll eat it. But, you know, you were frying chicken over here and uh, baking chicken for yourself. We don't want you to do it that way. Yeah, that makes absolutely mm -hmm. no sense. Mm -hmm. When my dad was diagnosed with diabetes, I was 17 years old, and the dietitian who didn't look like me gave him all a list of the things he couldn't have. Mm -hmm. He was a frustrated black man. And my mom was doing one pot for him and one pot for us. And we all said, this makes no sense. Mm -hmm. So we finally said, no, we're gonna eat together and eat a diabetic diet just like him. And we found out it was a heart, heart healthy way to eat. It was nothing magical mm -hmm. about it. We watched our portions and we stayed away from the greasy and salty things. Okay. And we have some family members when you start losing weight, oh, I don't like the way you look. I like you with a little meat on your bones. I like, uh, I like you, you know, you need, need to go back. We had a, a husband and wife that did that in our class. The wife started losing weight and the husband started getting upset because she's looking good and other men are starting to look at her because she's looking good. No, you got to, no, I don't want you on that diet anymore. So that was just, I just thought that was horrible. So we, we explained to him, she has high blood pressure, she, possibility of stroke. You need her to do this. Mm -hmm. and, and he need her to take care of him. He the one want to get sick. Exactly. So in, 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 in essence, it's not really about the weight. It's about the health. It's yes. about improving your health. Yeah. So, and mm -hmm. I, I'm pretty sure she brought him in kicking and screaming. Like you said, oh, man yeah. come in kicking and screaming. So. Well, what's your model fan about skinny people? Oh, 
there are a lot of fat people looking at skinny people in the grave. Think about it. Just because you're slim and trim doesn't mean that you're, you're gonna right have this armor and you can't get high blood pressure and you can't get diabetes. That's true. You might die first. So true. Before the person who's pleasantly plump. Mm -hmm. You could be pleasantly plump and still be healthy. That's true. God didn't make us to be all a size two or four. And you That's can be skinny and be unhealthy. Oh, oh yeah. We, we know a whole bunch of skinny, unhealthy people. Mm -hmm. Way more. Come through this class. We had one one man. He came to support his wife, and because she was, you know, pleasantly plump, as when he said. And when we did his blood pressure, we almost had to call nine one one. His blood pressure was so high. You're the one who need the help. Mm -hmm. You know. So you know, he's like this. His wife like this, and. He said, "Well, what's happening?" She said, "You are eating pigtails, pig feet, and all that." <laughs> And I'm eating Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it makes a difference. Wow. So that is that is wonderful. I am so uh, glad that I came here today. I appreciate yeah. everything you guys do and how you help the community. And I want to wish you guys continued success. You. Keep reaching out and, and, and serving and helping more people. Hopefully we can get a whole lot more people who need to be here mm -hmm. to come here and take advantage of the services that you guys offer. Yeah. And, you know. You keep doing what you're doing in your community. Yes, ma'am. Because it's real important we, we need foot that we like spread you. Yes, it yes. across this country. So you keep it up, Doc. Yes, ma'am. I will. I will. <laughs> so is there any last words that you would like to give out to my audience about improvement? My, I, I have one tagline I love to use uh, quite a bit. It's not about eating good but it's about eating well. Mm -hmm. And if you look at yourself in the mirror and say, did I eat good today or did I eat well? It's really gonna make you have a paradigm shift in focusing on changing your behaviors. Okay. Good health begins with good nutrition. Stay healthy. It's not about eating good, it's about eating well. Good health begins with good nutrition. Stay healthy. All right, that's it. I'll talk to you soon. Have a great day.